What's up, peeps? Paul from Lift Run Bang. I'm going to do a video Q&A tonight um, from some questions that I got on the Lift Run Bang Facebook page. But before we start, I want to say thanks to everyone who donated to the Relentless Charity um, for the fundraising I did for it. Uh, I'm really humbled at the amount of money we were able to raise in a short period of time. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody that donated to the cause. Uh, the meet is in five days, next Saturday, essentially. So I'm in the process of cutting weight to make weight. Uh, it's, you know, my training cycle was just okay for it, but I'm still going to go out and give my all. So um, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, but I, like I said, I wanted to give a big thanks to everybody who donated and uh, helped make this something bigger than just a powerlifting meet. So to get to the questions, I'm just going to do a few one of the good ones right here is a deload week. Basically, you know, what are you doing on a deload week? Is it better to uh, do like a 50% workout or get some light work in? For most guys, uh, I tell them to actually take a full 8 to 10 days off. When uh, I helped Marshall Johnson with his training going into Night of the Living Deadlift, the biggest thing Marshall had struggled with in the past was going into meets and feeling tired. He would have great training cycles, going heavy, training really hard, but by the time he would get to the meet, he'd be very burnt. And this is very common for a lot of guys because they don't trust their training. They feel like they need to go into their training and hit everything they want to hit at the meet. And that just doesn't make really a lot of sense. Uh, the whole point of being in the gym is to strength train so that you set yourself up uh, for, your, for your strength demonstration at the meet. And this gets lost in a lot of guys. Once you train to peak, and peaking is very real. I know that there's some people out there say that, that peaking's not real, whatever. I guess you need to go talk to uh, every guy who competed in the, the 80s uh, and early 90s that all use periodization and peaking cycles to set world records and tell them that that shit's not real. But peaking is very real, and a lot of guys don't understand that um, you need to set yourself up for super compensation going into the meet so that you can feel strong that can only happen uh, after you have an adequate recovery period so you need to train hard enough uh, to cause inroads in the recovery but then you need to allow that recovery to take place and the only way that you can do that is if you take enough time off between your last training cycle and the meat now some guys don't do as well with that I don't know if it's a mental thing or physical thing but most of the guys that that I help have them take a significant amount of time off before they compete, and then they feel great going into the meet. They're not injured. They're not beat up. They feel good. They're ready to lift. They're hungry, and that's a big part of going into a meet and feeling ready. So what I personally suggest is is taking 7 to 10 days off beforehand, something in that range of just pure rest and feeling good going into the meet. Um, another guy asked about problems with small off, uh, small off squat cycle, that kind of thing. The biggest thing that most guys do in regards to messing up those kind of those that type of programming is that they they always program too heavy. You're not supposed to program a true max into those those high volume, high frequency type uh, peaking programs. You should program in either like an everyday max um, or what you know some people call it everyday max. I call it an everyday max. Some people call it a training max. Either way, the point is something you can walk up to the bar, very little psych, and on an everyday kind of basis, do for a good single. Uh, you shouldn't have to get psyched up, or uh, or when I say psyched, I mean a lot of psych. You're, you're still going to need to prepare yourself, even for like a, a training max. But it should be something you program in that you can still hit any day of the week, and if you don't feel very well or are sick. So you have to think about that when you're programming those type of cycles. Otherwise, what happens is you get a couple weeks into it, four or five workouts into it, you start to feel very beat up, start to feel very fatigued, you start missing weights, you can't make all the sets and reps, uh, and that's a, that's a problem that most guys have. So um, my biggest advice for if you're going to run that kind of cycle, back way off on what you're going to program in for your max and go from there. Another guy asks about a weight cut for two-hour weigh-ins. That's how they used to do it in the old days. They didn't have always have 24-hour weigh-ins. They'd have a short weigh-in, two or three hours. Uh, it, you know what that comes back to is how much weight you have to cut. Generally speaking, if it's more than 5%, I wouldn't advise it. Just compete in whatever weight class uh, you're going to be in. 
but if you're in the 5% range, and what I mean by that is, is that, um, for example, if you're a 242 guy, then that 5% is going to be somewhere in the range of, you don't need to weigh more than about uh, 252 or 253, somewhere in that range, give or take. So that's about 5% of your body weight. Um, you want to go in, the faster you get the weight off, the faster it'll come back on. So you want to take all of that weight off in about a day uh, or less. You want to take it off very quickly. And then my suggestion, obviously, then is you have to recomp and you have a very short period of time to recomp. So it's it's uh, basically going to be um, some whey protein with, you know, 120 plus grams of carbs. I get this figure from my diet guy, uh, Mike Israel. You should check him out on Renaissance Periodization. But, it, I mean, it'll be the same protocol, but it, what, what it all really comes back to is how much weight you have to cut. If you're having to cut more than that 5%, I just suggest staying in the weight class that you're going to be in and eating your ass off leading up to the meat. Um, and I mean for the whole week. Otherwise, if you're 5%, try to take off that 5% as quickly as possible so you can recomp. You'll recomp very fast uh, if you do it correctly, and uh, that would be what I suggest. Another question is how important is dumbbell work in unilateral movements, so joint health, um, as opposed to just using barbells 100% of the time. You should use both. And a lot of guys don't do enough uh, one-legged work. Uh, then they don't realize how much uh, weaker one leg is than the other until you have them do like sets of, uh, you know, like 10 or 20 on split squats. And they can really feel the difference from one leg to the other. Now, when you think about putting a loaded barbell on your back and then you have a large imbalance in strength from leg to leg, you may not necessarily feel it, but one leg is going to do the brunt of the work in comparison to the other. So it's important that you keep stuff like one-legged work in uh, along with kind of retraining yourself to make sure to try to distribute the weight and load evenly across your limbs the best that you can. If you're not doing one-legged work or you're not doing your dumbbell work, it may not appear to you uh, that you have these great imbalances, but uh, if you keep in your dumbbell work, like your dumbbell pressing, dumbbell bench pressing, dumbbell incline, dumbbell overhead, that will at least keep some semblance of balance. It's also another reason why I like close grip benching better than wide, other than the fact that I have a permanent separated shoulder, is because if you're when you're you see lots of guys when they're benching and they're wide and the weight comes up uneven. Well, that's part of a muscular imbalance, too, is that one side is doing uh, more work than the other. Obviously, the one side that's going to come up faster is stronger than the weak side. And this is another reason why a lot of guys get injured is because they refuse to do stuff like, like you know, take 10 pounds or 15 pounds off your bench uh, rather than uh, bring your, your grip in. It's, it's harder if your grip's in close. You don't have to the bench as close as I do, but if your grip is in close, uh, it's hard for your body to uh, try to compensate and lean towards the stronger side and, and you know protect the weaker side. Whereas the wider you get, the more that strong side is going to try to do the brunt of the work, uh, and the weak side does less of it. And this you know increases your chance of injury uh, and essentially keeps you unbalanced. So you have to think about those kind of things when you're when you're figuring out what technique is correct for you as well. So I suggest guys do a lot of split squats, lunges, one-legged work. You can do uh, uh, one-legged leg press as well. Do those things to keep balance and keep injuries away. Uh, like I said, for your upper body, uh, do stuff like laterals. You should already be doing stuff like bent laterals for your for your rear delts and uh, and rhomboid work and stuff like that. So you want to keep the uh, the single limb movements in to keep that overall balance going. Um, let's see, what else did we have? Um, why do people still believe in CNS burnout? I don't know. I can't answer that. I can't tell you why there's people that have whole TV shows dedicated to finding Bigfoot either. I think once a myth gets perpetuated on the internet, it's hard to kill it. Especially when people just keep repeating. It's like the telephone games. Like People will say, well, of course CNS burnout is real. Why? Because they were really tired one day after they had a hard squat workout. I mean, that's essentially how it goes. From all the reading and research that I've done from, that, from medical doctors that have actually looked into some of these things, 
the whole thing that you feel that people deem CNS burnout is really just fatigue. Um, not to mention the fact that it's your peripheral nervous system that does the basically the lifting portion. Um, you're not your central nervous system. So, but what most guys think of as quote unquote CNS burnout is really um, just a decline or a severe reduction in the the fuels that you need to lift uh, and and be strong, glycogen, ATP, um, stuff like that. So um, you what you really need to do when you feel like that, obviously, is just rest and eat up. I mean, it's really that simple. It's not a complicated mechanism where you need to switch exercises or uh, you know not deadlift anymore. Deadlift is always the big one. Well, I couldn't pull my deadlift because my CNS was burned out. Your CNS was burned out. You're not in the gym deadlifting. You're in the fucking hospital with some tube stuck up your ass. So uh, try to keep these things in perspective. Uh, what matters at the end of the day, regardless of what people tell you, it's your muscles that are lifting the weights, uh, not your nervous system. So just focus on getting bigger, getting stronger. Uh, that's one of the things that I will talk about or I wrote about in my baseball book is essentially uh, building up not only your muscular base, but your strength base, your technique base. And that's a lot of people I get, I'm getting a lot of write-ins and asking, well, is base building is like six to eight reps or is this base building? It's a, it's an overall methodology that you have to build your strength base, your technique base and your muscular base. It is not, it's not a rep scheme or a set scheme per se. It's building everything from top to bottom. So I wanted to get that in there as well. Uh, again, once again, thanks to everybody who donated. Uh, to the relentless cause for everybody who's going to be there uh, i can't wait to see you and meet you uh and uh i'm looking forward to going and crushing it so thanks everybody